Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Going to talk about the Grant Morrison, Dave McKean, Batman Arkham Asylum, DC's biggest selling original graphic novel still to this day. Uh, before we dive into this, I want to invite everybody watching at home to like, follow, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell icon to be notified when we post a new video. It'll give you a leg up on the Kayfabe effect. Uh, sometimes these books are a little bit rare to begin with, so you want to be the first one looking for it uh, when we post a new video because they disappear throughout the day or the prices go up. That's known as the kayfabe effect, and by subscribing and turning those notifications on, you can be the first one in line tracking it down. Also, let these videos play through to the end. That allows YouTube's algorithm to share our videos with other comics fans who haven't found Cartoonist Kayfabe yet. It's how we grow this channel, and we appreciate your help spreading the Cartoonist Kayfabe word. So, Ed, as I'm saying best-selling original graphic novel in, in DC publishing history at about half a million copies by uh, 2020. It starts in 1989. I think I picked mine up, must have been in the mid-90s, maybe because uh, it was such a good seller, I was able to find one at a maybe a little discount rate or something, because this would have been pretty rich for my blood in, the, uh, in my high school days. I wasn't buying a lot of hardcover graphic novels, but hard not to be impressed by the look of this thing. Like, it just didn't look like any other comics I had seen. And Grant Morrison and Dave McKean at that point had, had a pretty, pretty uh, interesting reputations, both of them. So add Batman to the mix, and I, was, I, had to, I had to try it whenever I got the opportunity. When we go low, lo-fi, you don't, you don't need a hard cover. You could get a soft cover for the price of $15 in those early 1990s, which is how I got mine. And uh, it's cool to hear you say that it, it's, you know, the highest selling original graphic novel because I got this thing at Walden Books uh, after looking at it time and time again, visiting the bookstore, and there was no Dark Knight Returns there. There was no Watchmen there. Uh, on the strength of some of the Joker visuals, I just couldn't imagine. Like, this is actually the book that where I experienced that thing that you hear old heads talk about. Like, comics can be this. Comics can be more. Uh, comics was only the stuff that I got at the spinner rack at the grocery store for a good chunk of my life. And I would peek my head into Walden Books because they would have uh, comic books on the newsstand. And there would be the smallest smattering of books with spines, uh, comic yes. books with spines, like on their bookshelves. Uh, this was one of them. And to see a fully painted Batman comic, uh, it kind of scared me. Uh, some of these visuals and that Joker just blew my mind. Like I saw that Joker in my dreams. They they talk about in here that uh, he that he's possessed by the spirit of Papa Gady, some some voodoo priest. <laughs> and, and like I think I think that thing infected my soul. Uh, after, That's hilarious. After I first saw it, <laughs> but I picked this up super early in the night. This is the exact copy that I grabbed uh, way back in those days, man. Yeah, it's it's gonna. I had a great time reading this this week. Um, I did not remember enjoying it nearly as much as I did on the reread and just much more impressed this time. I think I was confused by it early on whenever I first read it. I just, like you say, hadn't seen comics that looked like this, was not ready as a reader for a comic like this. And uh, it was very nice to revisit. But it's interesting because I have like, I think this is a 2020, you know, I don't know if it's an anniversary edition. It's the Black Label. It has a bunch of extra stuff in it. it has notes from Grant Morrison and Dave McKean. So you kind of get some extra insight into the maybe putting the book together. And one of the things that I want to mention before I forget is the letterer. So the letterer is Gaspar Saladino, longtime DC letterer. And everybody talks about him in this book. I think Karen Berger might have a, a piece in here too. She was the editor of the original series. And they talk about like his quality as a letterer and what he brings to this book. And uh, the reason that I make a big production about it is this is your original presentation, uh, you know, like your, your credits page. This is the new edition where Gaspar Saladino, same size as your Grant Morrison and Dave McKean, writer and illustrator, letterer, all the same size. Pretty neat. There's also um, Batman created by Bob Kane. Batman created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger now in this new edition, uh, the, the credits on the new edition. We were comparing and contrasting uh, this Black Label edition with the original. And one thing that I absolutely want to make, want to see if they kind of update it a little bit is some of the Joker font. Uh, they did. The pages because Glad you mentioned that. The original, uh, it, is, it is downright hard to read in spots. The thing about these kinds of comics, a comic like this, 
this is this is bleeding edge comics, and they call things bleeding edge because there is blood. There 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 are cuts, cuts and lacerations along the way. So so in the original version, uh, their lettering is even cropped. Like the the artwork gets cropped off too much sometimes, and you lose whole like you know the entire left side of captions and word balloons sometimes. So I'm imagining they address that in here as well. Yeah, I didn't notice any any lettering being cut off, but um, I'll say off the top, that Joker lettering to me is the biggest flaw in this book. Mm -hmm. And they try to address it, they treat it a little bit differently in this new edition, but it still fails to me because okay. it's really hard to read. And I, I have a solution to propose for it too. I should have mocked something up to illustrate it, but maybe I'll put something on screen. But it's it's an overall minor minor quibble i think based on i really like the rest of the package the story the art it slows you down a lot it does uh and uh just some context for for the the, the art duties by by dave mckean um i comics was at war it was a big business in those eight after 86 money was being made and now you have competition and marvel and dc are battling in some ways marvel is sort of eating DC's lunch on, like the newsstand racks, man. With with all you know, post Secret Wars, all all that kind of stuff. They they were dominating, uh, but then Marvel had Bill, Bill Sienkiewicz to be their idiosyncratic guy, and you largely associate him with Marvel projects, like in those '80s. So like, I feel like Dave McKean was the DC response to the Sienkiewicz energy. So. McKean goes through and re, kind of remasters all of the artwork in here and, and writes about it. It's really cool. Like, I have this dream uh, list now of, like, a roundtable panel of a bunch of guys who scan and, you know, really get into kind of... They even use the word information to describe, like, how they adjust the art now, you know, and, and you just have better, better tools now to get more of that information. But in looking at the art, he acknowledges how much Sienkiewicz is on these pages. Yeah. So, yeah, you're not the only one to make that observation. Ed, Dave McKean himself uh, acknowledges that. And I say, let's let's dive in and, and we'll hit this stuff as we go through. But you can see right away, like, these collage elements, which... I think of Dave McKean, first time he's really on my radar, are the Sandman covers. Yeah. And you can see him building these, like, real objects in 3D and, you know, I assume photographing to get some of this material onto the page. Going through this, uh, even like these early parts, it sort of jumped into my mind that what I perceive as the Vertigo aesthetic is really all Dave McKean. I think that's true. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. And it becomes uh, Dave McKean derivative. Yeah. And... <sighs> I don't, we're not going to do a page by page of this, but it's worth noting some of the adjustments that happen with this art because, again, this is Dave McKean doing these adjustments and trying, I think, to get it close to the original source material. Yeah. So this is your first printing or an early printing, and this is this new edition that he's kind of gone through and cleaned up a little bit. And you can see desaturated is, is the word that I would use, probably a little bit more subtle in how some of the backgrounds and textures are. Uh, communicator represented there and again it's the artist making the choice you know so i think trying to stay close to the original source material as possible is what you're seeing here um i'll be honest I, a lot of the images i prefer are in that or in, in the original printing they're a little bit more they're colorful warmer. yeah they're way way warmer i wonder if that has to do with uh i think a lot of this was photographed like you could see shadows and mm -hmm. stuff in in the in the paint right there I wonder if a warmer light was used uh, when you set up, you know, it's a system. I think it's like 245 degree lights pointing toward yeah. the thing. Uh, maybe he had a warmer bulb or something and now he's trying to subdue it. Yeah, I, I, I can't I can't speak for that. And like I said, it's, you know, <laughs> as an artist, I feel like he, it's his the benefit of the doubt is definitely with Dave McKean as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, I'm guessing it has to do with fidelity to the original images that he's making yeah see here's an example like just real quick where you could see the crop is different on on some of these pages yeah so like i'll point out whenever and here's two different yeah. treatments with the uh, typography and I'll, I'll point out like in the original some of the cropped off lettering if i if i spot it so worth noting too in, in a lot of the the text like the set text will change a little bit yeah um you know not always a big difference but it seems like that's something that he probably went back in and touched up just a little bit this is just so much sharper i think so too right yeah uh but man no books look like this no no, no dc books this is 89 pre-vertigo i'm not sure when vertigo comes about but i mean like this is it feels unbelievable really shocking in a way yeah it feels unbelievable like you can't imagine how how one can 
can make one of these images, let alone like a book full of them, to put a story together. And this came out as an original piece, right? So that yes. was that was even uh, a bleeding edge idea to have a hundred plus page comic book. Uh, I I can't think of another one where it was like would be like over a hundred pages of original material bound like this. I think they went through like twelve sets of proofs to make this book. I can imagine you need to do a lot of wet proofs looking at it. I mean, he, like, he still wasn't happy, you know? So, like, a lot of uh, pre-production had to be done, certainly. It's also wild to me, there's so many approaches to, like, what is this image? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how are you ma How are you thinking that this is the kind of thing that you're creating and putting on the page? You know what I am going to say, though, man? Let's have a moratorium on Lewis Carroll <laughs> quotes at the beginning of our books. Like, maybe this was one of the uh, innovative comics to use it. Uh, but it has been overused since. Whenever there's a surrealistic kind of element... That's in comic, hilarious. They will use some through-the-looking-glass <laughs> bullshit. Like, let's put a moratorium on that, man. Dig a little deeper. That's real funny. <laughs> and the story splits between uh, Amadeus Arkham, the founder of Arkham Asylum, and Batman, essentially. So we're going to get a lot of this type, and this is where you get into uh, Saladino's contribution, because... We'll hear many characters, kind of their voices. Yeah. It's important to be able to know who's talking, yeah. and the way you do it is through his distinct lettering for each character. But we're going to do a lot of cross-cutting between Batman in the present and Arkham in the, uh, you know, in 100 years past in his diary. Yeah, and these, these pages are wisely constructed as spreads, so it's never jarring when it goes from one moment to the next because they are laid out to go across both, both pages. Yeah, like I said, I struggled with this when I was a kid reading it. Uh, this reread, though, not so much. Like it was pretty clear, besides the Joker font that we that we mentioned. Right, and and you could make artistic excuses for for the Joker font and stuff. But uh, I feel like this comic really is the comic that taught me the idea of like uh, typeface as voice. And maybe the first time you read, you just didn't know have that part of comics in your head. Uh, I could see that being a piece that you give this to a civilian and they just get confused. But we, we yes. know this now, you know, that, that you see these different typefaces, you're getting a different point of view. Uh, I had, um, when, when Shaken was in town, he, uh, we were just, we, we caught, we caught dinner and stuff. He said that Karen Berger is pretty much the one that instituted that idea of like, no thought balloons right. in uh, in my comics. So you had to get voice across somehow, and this is how the Vertigo fellas figured out how to do it. It reminds me of uh, of Watchmen would be the other comic that I think of as having like a, diff a distinct lettering style for different characters. Rorschach's journal comes to mind. Yeah. And there'll be a... I, uh, th there's another Watchmen piece in the back of this where we see the notes and sketches by Morrison. Yeah. And I feel like his layout for the cover is the inverse of the Watchmen cover layout, where, like, Watchmen has, you know, 20% is, is lettering the title, and then 80% is your image. And the layouts that are in the back are the inverse. I see. So it's like a 20% little skinny vertical for the image, and then the rest is the text for the cover. Um, I linger here because he talks about of magic, uh, mis mysterious symbols. Grant Morrison, long known for his um, association with magic and interest in magic, it's all in here. You mentioned the Joker being like a voodoo god or demon or spirit or something. That's in here. There's symbols already of the beetle, you know, coming out of Arkham's mother's mouth. We're going to see it again and again. Yeah. Like Arkham creates a spell in the one room or, or kind of over the entire house. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, it's this is Grant Morrison early on. We talk about like young writers who they get their shot and it's like, all their ideas come flying out. There's a ton of Grant Morrison ideas on these pages. I, I don't know how the genesis of this was created, but there were a lot of smart decisions at play. One of them being, get Dave McKean to do interpretations of many vil villains. Yes. Like, you have this guy uh, on with this exceptional vis visual acumen. Like, let's see what his Mad Hatter looks like. Let's see what the Killer Croc looks like. Uh, as a tongue-in-cheek Batman story, it's real sharp. Uh, Grant Morrison, also known as a biter, uh, usually of the Alan Moore school, but this is certainly uh, Batman goes one flew over the cuckoo's nest to a certain extent. You know, the bad guys can get out anytime. They just they they, they enjoy their stay there. <laughs> <laughs> They're having fun. Yeah, there's a there's a state 
a comedy sketch like that where they're in a prison and there's just one side of the prison wall isn't there. And they're like, you can go this way. <laughs> so the story, of course, Batman called in because the inmates have taken over the asylum and they have one last demand and they want uh, Batman to come in. Send Batman in, Gordon. This is still the early days, man. And there's this whole gimmick with I'm going like, to pluck this lady's eyeballs out and then it's proven that he, that he doesn't. There, right. there are several versions of that sort of thing where it, it seems super hellish and then it go, goes nowhere. And then you wonder, are these bad guys really that bad or are they just goofballs? <laughs> like, come on, man. Squash this lady's eyes. Jeez. It's the Red Room guy talking, by the way. Here's a, let me yeah, do it. a comparison here. So here's the difference in the additions for Joker's lettering. Joker's lettering is this red lettering. Um, this one's pretty legible, but they're not all that way. Like you can see, I think that's a better example of it gets far out. And I think it looks good, but the background, at first, it was a white drop shadow. On the new edition, it's like a dark maroon drop shadow. Not great. Not no. great for reading. And what my solution would be is take a white and just kind of scribble behind it. Yeah. Like, don't even define, you know, like a nice, neat edge, but give it a white behind there so that we can actually see the lettering clearly because it's just very hard to pick out on some of these backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. Like, real tough. So. Look at that one. Clearly, um, you know, McKean's acknowledging like this was not ideal, but I, I still think uh, there's a way to make it even better because here you see a lighter background behind it and that's probably the most readable that you're going to get whenever there is a light background. So I think you could just almost scribble a shape behind it just to create a little bit of an easier reading experience for the Joker. But the Joker, as you say, star of this book yeah. in a lot of ways. So yeah, that, that's, that sketch of uh, I'm putting this pencil in an art, the young artist's eye that's the hostage. I remember that part from my reading this when I was a kid. <laughs> Pretty disturbing stuff. And, of course, Batman, he's going to go in because what kind of book would we have if he didn't? Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comics that Ed Piscor and I make. Red Room Trigger Warnings. The second season of Red Room, all self-contained stories, issues one to four, now available in comic shops everywhere. Red Room, the anti-social network, the trade paperback collection of the first season of Red Room, now available in comic shops everywhere. Minus 28 countries where it's banned and 10 comic shops, but you can still request it there. And coming in September, the collection, the trade paperback of Red Room Trigger Warnings will be in stores in September. You can pre-order that now at your local comic shop or online wherever you buy your books. Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness in comic shops everywhere. The 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I am writing, drawing lettering, coloring, the Grand Design treatment, retelling that 60-year history, and you can now pre-order the Hulk Grand Design oversized treasury collection, uh, about 40 extra pages in that. It'll be in stores before Christmas, but you can pre-order it now in your comic shops or in your bookstores wherever you're, you buy comics. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Love these. Um, I, I, I really like this part first time through Dave McCain's, like, I don't know, wash and, and pencil drawings yeah i always thought that stuff looked really good if you've seen signal to noise one of his um first graphic novels there's a lot of that kind of work in there really good drawer I, it's hard to believe this is the first mckean that, that we're putting on the channel three three and a half years worth of uh videos well you know what here's my plea to everybody get some good numbers on here because i want to look at cages yeah I, i'd look at signal to noise you know like uh I, I would like to put more on. You know, one of the ones that we're going to have to look at for sure uh, is the Mr. Punch graphic novel he did with Neil Gaiman. When when Neil came to town, he said that uh, that is the book that he wishes more people would revisit. Uh, it's one of his favorite books, and it kind of just la languished. Let's bring some, some eyeballs back to that. Yeah. He perfected the techniques from this into Mr. Punch. I still don't know what I'm looking at half the time in no, his I work. Know. I think that it's it's some of it's like photographed and then he starts working on top of his photos. Yeah, you like there's we used to do this this thing in art school like um, in art class in like high school where you can take a uh photograph and then you could put like paint thinner or something on top and you start to smear it a little bit and you could get like an interesting mosaic effect. Yeah, it's he's a real artist. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, I look at this and I think like yeah, he could be doing anything besides comics. And he does. Like, we're, it, we're very lucky that he decided comics were a thing he was interested yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, at his credits in the back, it's like uh, 
continuing series in Face magazine, illustrated novel by Jonathan Carroll, numerous book covers, various other works, written and performed music, soundtracks, TV commercials, and videos. Like, the guy, he's a renaissance man. Yeah, absolutely. And this is Arkham's backstory. You know, he has his family, a daughter and a wife, uh, trying to uh, work with, I guess, criminals, you know, to reform them. And uh, the backstory is important because we're going to see one of those reformed criminals doesn't reform. He yeah. kills his wife and daughter yeah. and uh, kind of sets him down a certain path or sets uh, Arkham Asylum down a certain path. I think, I think that his initial interest in the, in the brain and stuff had, had to do with his mom who right. was going through psychosis. And then it was about understanding psychosis. And uh, the easiest place you could get a good sample of those guys are some criminal goofballs. <laughs> Yeah, guinea, guinea pigs for his uh, experimentation. Yeah. And here we go. Th what a money spread this is. You know, Batman entering this Arkham Asylum by himself, and who's waiting to greet him? Of course, the Joker. Amazing looking. Absolutely. I, I saw uh, this image of Joker in a Wizard magazine when I first started getting Wizard, like before I saw Arkham Asylum. And uh, that image alone is so evocative. You have to scoop up this book and see what that, that's about. Yeah, it's, it's so effective. In the back, they show a mask that he had of the Joker as like a starting point. And again, you know, maybe photographing it, lighting it, and then painting on top of those photos and, and really kind of bringing out this version of the Joker. And you can see why they wanted a distinct font. And you know what? It actually, I think, works pretty well in this panel, too. So, you know, if you had a flat, dark background behind it or a flatter white light background, I think it would work. It's whenever you get it on top of some of the textures that it really becomes hard for me to read. Yeah. And uh, and we learn that Pearl, our artist, both her eyes are fine. So April Fool's on that one. And that's one of your, your best images where he's just washed out. It reminds me of whenever the hacker took over the Max Headroom hacker. Something about the lighting really reminded me of that over and over when we see him and his face is just this white washed out, you know, shadows in the bottom half look. Yeah. Very unsettling. <laughs> um, the Joker version, different than Grant Morrison's first draft, originally he wanted the Joker to be dressed like Madonna in the Like a Prayer video. And I, I, I don't know if it's the powers that be that said, no, we're not going to do that. Or I mean, if it's something that Dave McKean, I, you know, I'm not sure how they deviated from that. If it was something Grant Morrison got away from maybe in subsequent drafts, but one of the notes in the back. I, that's the thing. I think that there's a little restraint in this entire book, including that, that eyeball sequence. Like, something tells me that editorial came down a little bit with all the stuff that we've read from Grant Morrison over the years. There, this, this feels restrained in a lot of ways, man. If, if he was to go revisit Arkham Asylum, and I'm not talking a book, but I'm talking a premises and mm -hmm. do, do a story, uh, it would be much tougher. It's also neat to think that this is one of his initial pitches, um, Arkham Asylum and Batman and all of Batman's villains and everything, because for so long, like whenever he did JLA, I remember it was like, wait, Morrison's doing a, like a superhero? Like, may, because it seemed their sensibility was so outside of that based on Doom Patrols and Animal Man. I was surprised that Morrison even cared about superheroes, but it's there from the beginning, you know, like this book shows just how much that's a part of their... I don't know, history, fandom, interests. There was editorial uh, conceits to to this. Uh, when, when these British guys came over, they had a lot of these kind of highfalutin ideas and things. And DC Editorial was like, let's introduce you to the public a little bit before you go make a Sandman comic. Or uh, I think he's already doing Animal Man and things at, at this point. But we need to properly introduce you guys to the American audience. So this this was a vehicle for that, for McKean and uh, for Grant Morrison. Different lettering for each of the villains, too. Yes. You don't see it as much as you see Joker, but we will see it some. And then in the back, there are profiles of these different villains, and they all have their own lettering, like writing out their profiles. Who Killed Danby, reference to the Malcolm Claren Sex Pistols movie from the 70s with appearances by Sting, the I musician, think, not the wrestler. I think there are a lot of references in here that I that are just over my head. Yeah. This is, I think, the guy in charge of uh, Arkham Asylum at this point. Um, we get into ideas of therapy, so one of the things Batman takes exception of is Two-Face is at this point, like, pissing and shitting himself because he can't make decisions. 
They've introduced first a die instead of like the two-sided coin and now a tarot deck. So he has like huge number of choices for any decision he's trying to make and he's just become this indecisive shell of his former self. It's a real examination of obsessive compulsive disorder in certain ways, man, yeah. because uh, if you tell somebody they have 64 options, uh, whether it's time to go to the bathroom or not, I could see a certain kind of person spinning their wheels and uh, running out of time. The way the Joker's depicted, it looks like somebody wearing a mask. It does. And there's something unsettling about that. It's like his head's too big. Now we get into, uh, I, I love any time you get to see McKean's like drawing on display. Oh yeah. It's a really nice, nice piece. And I think this is one where you can see the restoration is much more faithful to the, probably the original well, graphite. Well, like interesting, like, you know, there's reds that I, I don't see from this distance at, at least. Yeah, definitely in the nose there. And I just think the resolution of the old print technology was, was rougher. You know, the dots seem further apart when it comes to the printing. The dots seem much smaller here. Perhaps the old printing just wasn't 300 DPI. You know, it probably was. Like, now it's probably newer printing. You can go higher. With the uh, Whenever I turned in Hulk, that was like my notes were um, tighter screens. Because you can definitely get like 600 and maybe even 1200 DPI Color? screens. Yeah, I don't know that you would go 1200, but you can get higher screens. You just kind of need to find the right printer and make sure the printer knows that's what you're looking for. And there's also the non-pattern dots now. Uh, stochastic I think is the name of it but the first book I knew of that was like that big oversized Kramer's was mm -hmm. printed that way and it's supposed to blend color a little better because the dot patterns organic rather than like the tight you know 45 degree screens and parallel dots that was the thing that's always the most mind-boggling when you look at the at at these these old books like the old Sakevich stuff and, and even like Lynn Varley's colors on like Electra Lives Again or something because it becomes it's like fractal or something you know like these evenly spaced dots and it's still cmyk but like those magenta dots are very noticeable if you look closely and there's no magenta in the paint that she used or whatever like you so you get that here and you 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 will get reds that show up like it's the reason why in digital color you don't use black to mix yeah. your colors because you will notice a black muddy color sometimes they go through um various i don't know psychiatry you know like they were looking at, at uh the, the rorschach tests there and saying what they see they're going to do word association because batman this whole time is you know it's joker's pretty much saying hey you're where you belong you're you know you're part of this gang you're part of this group you should be here and uh the whole time batman is trying to pretty much stand off from that that point of view so uh it comes into play late in the book but it's it's ongoing you know anytime joker or somebody brings up some kind of test batman is eager to pass that test and show that no, he's not crazy. He's not like the rest of, uh, you know, his rogues gallery. That was his one up apprehension before stepping foot into the joint. Right. Like fuck, maybe, maybe I go in there. I'm not coming out. Going full Jack Nicholson. So here's our word association: mother, pearl, handle, revolver, gun, father, and. Uh, that's it. Don't even get through the whole two pages before Batman is, is done saying stop. And Joker, of course, that's a victory for him. <laughs> I mean, that lets you know everything you need to know about Batman. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's preoccupied. You mentioned Alan Moore and I think of Killing Joke and some of the some of the relationship stuff between Batman and Joker in this book. It feels like it's it's built very much on the, uh, I don't know, the foundation that Killing Joke lays down it's, about it's, their relationship. Yeah, it's just very clear that they need one another. The fact that they let, I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole climax of this thing illustrates that. And it's not necessarily Joker who's the one who says it, but it's very clear. They, they need Batman. You have uh, Professor Young and Aleister Crawley and Chess and Taro, <laughs> you know, is, is uh, Amadeus Arkham is educating himself and, and preparing for this life. Who, uh, Grant Morrison? That's, that's what I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whenever these painters uh, kind of create their own char like characters for their big works, it's usually modeled off of somebody. And I, I wonder who good old Amadeus Arkham is, is modeled after because the, the sort of likeness is consistent throughout 
It would have been great if it was Grant Morrison. Yeah, it would have been the best to cast him in, <laughs> it's cast like, them in this role. He's cast enough in stuff. Clownfish, it feels a little spot on. A little on the nose, as they say. Yeah. See, this is cool, because, like, the fe fidelity of the photo, it feels smoother. Like, it's good that it feels smoother here, because this totally feels like a Xerox of a Xerox in the OG. Yeah, it's wild to compare them. Some are, like, more in focus, almost. Yeah, yeah. Sharper. And I, I wonder about that a lot, if that's just a matter of... If they were shooting slides... Because I think a lot of this stuff would have been shot that way, like you said, you know, with your lights set up and everything, photographing art. You could be just slightly out of focus mm -hmm. and not know, you know, not really, not much you could do about it, um, you know, after the fact, once you realized, like, it wasn't as crystal clear as, as you want it to be. And now that Batman's here, Joker is ready for the, uh, the big fun, and that is play a game of hide and seek <laughs> send batman into the heart of arkham asylum and and they'll give him a head start and then they're going to chase him there's another bambi uh yeah on the screen interesting to see what pops up several times like that and then the faces of like these you know i guess it's the wayne parents with the red slit eyes really odd they're almost batman-esque you know talking to the young bruce wayne yeah There are times with these consistent panel structures that I don't know if I'm supposed to read this way. I had that experience. Or this way. Yeah, it doesn't... It, it hurts because some of those earlier spreads are clearly... You're yeah. reading them across as spreads. And I, I don't think that's how this is supposed to be. I think this is like two pages. Yeah. But I had that experience too. And I think it's inevitable if you're going to have two-page spreads and then suddenly... Like, what's the indicator that this isn't a two-page spread? There isn't yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it doesn't have to happen. Like, that's that's just a fetishization of, of the artwork, the art making that allows for that. But, uh, you know, that's just another one of the mi sort of minor flaws. Uh, it, but it does take you out of the storytelling of it. You know, this could be another example, especially when you see, like, is this one panel? I love this doing Two-Face this way, you know? Totally in profile, and then profile the other direction. Yeah. This is Ted Bundy, right? I was thinking Anthony Perkins from Psycho. Oh, interesting. Yeah, maybe that would make sense, right? From, from like a later Psycho. You know, the, those ones made in the 80s. And I think that the uh, the Two-Face from those Christopher Nolan flicks com comes, comes from here. Uh, not necessarily this image, but you'll see ones where it's like a half skull. And Arkham coming home from his, his travels abroad, and this is the part. His wife is the first thing he sees, and she's just cut up, body in pieces. And uh, he says he wonders where her head is, and we see inside of this dollhouse. And I wonder, like, is that a reference to Sandman and the British Invasion and Neil Gaiman? I... There's several things, because Doc Destiny is one of the guys in here, and Doc Destiny is the last, like, th uh, three issues of the first run, you know, like, inside the, um, the diner. Here, reference to the cuckoo because this is a Ken Casey meditation. Wow. Yeah, that's that's fun. Any of this stuff is I, I love it. He also revisits the idea. There's there's those like uh, blonde cuckoos from the new X Men. Uh, from his new X Men run, you know, I forget the the something cuckoos. I must confess, I did not read that whole run. And the doll's house looks at me. It's <laughs> <laughs> this is some of that Sienkiewicz, where uh, like the um, Kingpin mm -hmm. from from that Love and War graphic novel. You can see the lace is like real lace, you know, put on top of whatever painting, collage, drawing stuff that he's assembling, which is part of why you know. A lot of this book is photographed and not scanned because yeah. you have those 3D elements. And just like, look at this ballsy stuff. With the, well, I guess you can't really see it so easy there. But uh, how just, dramatic a difference is, or, or is this spread? Yeah, just these strokes, like so confident, so striking. They really do just kind of smooth out. And it's um, after Fritz 
Schneider. So. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that painter, but but it's you know like we do uh, after John Byrne or after Todd McFarlane. <laughs> McKean's doing like real fine art painters. <laughs> I'm not sure this might be that Doc Destiny. No, I forget. I looked this this character up. I forget his name. Um, he should be in the back. It is It is back there. And we're going to look like idiots for not knowing this off the top of our heads, but so gross. Yeah. Like, horrible looking. You know, symbol of pestilence and disease and stuff. Just trying to touch Batman, you know, to bring him into this world. And he's so repulsed by it. Batman again and again has that re- almost like a revulsion to these other to his rogues. You know, when Joker touches him, he's like, "Get your filthy hands off of me!" And uh, same kind of thing here, where it's like, "Don't touch me!" Right? Yeah, I mean, is he Black Mask? Is he Professor Milo? He's not. Uh, his lettering piece isn't in the back. There. Mm. Almost like that Egon Schiele type uh, proportions there. Yeah, it's cool to see these different drawing styles as we go through the different characters. Yeah, man. I, like, I start to think of like Hoche Anderson. K- kicks him down the stairs. Yeah, that, that's a character that, that I wonder, like, like, who is that? Is that Doc Destiny then? Where's Doc Destiny in this thing? Because his piece is at the end, but I, it was unclear to me where he is throughout it. But here you go, man. It's like, dude, this is proto-Coraline imagery. Uh, and it's exactly what you would want. If you have a piece of talent like Dave McKean, you do not hamstring him and just make it a Joker story. We need to see his Scarecrow. We need to see his Mad Hatter. All of it. Yeah, definitely. Be greedy with pushing that dude and his chops. We see so many of these images of, like, the hand mm-hmm. extending and, and being, you know, kind of reaching for something. There's your Mad Hatter. I mean, is that contraband in, in the asylum? <laughs> like, uh, who signed off on all that stuff? <laughs> Very critical of the, uh, the staff there at Arkham, <laughs> this book. It, it's it's, it's full-on Willowbrook, man. Oh, and, and here we go, back to our uh, Arkham flashback. He's now treating the murderer of his wife and daughter. And uh, there's a bit of a, a problem with the electroshock. And he just fries this guy. <laughs> There's ozone and smell of burned skin in my nostrils, but I feel nothing. Yeah. Good prose, man. R- real seamless. Almost has a little bit of like a Vincent Price vibe in some of this stuff. Yeah, it's easy to get lost in the artwork. Totally. Real testament to what McKean can do. He would be a guy to get like a director's commentary. Like, like he probably would never want to do that or verbalize the stuff. But, uh, you know, this means something to him. Check this out, dude. Uh, this is perhaps purely photoshopped or something. But you can see like a seam that's not visible mm-hmm. there, amongst a lot of other spatter and speckles and things. Yeah, the seams in his work are really amazing. Even these panels, like these three panels, look like they're almost part, you know, uh, part of whatever that background image is. Yeah. Like he's working on one piece there. It's not a neat seam like some of the panel borders, you know, stuff like this, where those could be completely separate paintings that he's putting together. But other places, it's almost like he's painting on the same canvas with them. I mean, motherfucking circuit board, dude. (laughs) Right. Did he just crack open a TV? Yeah, and, and whatever these tubes and wires are, right on top of it. So is that a print of a circuit board that you can then go in and paint on top of? Maxi Zeus is the villain here. That's not Dr. Manhattan? <laughs> right, with the blue lettering? <laughs> totally, like, totally. Hard not to see it. Wonder what uh, Dave McKean's morgue files look like, <laughs> right? Yeah. What is he pulling Weekly some World of this news. stuff from? <laughs> Incredible! Boy. It's a fuzzy Bat Boy, <laughs> Bat Boy fetus or something. He's pulling out. <laughs> but I mean, is this like a mushroom? I feel like that's a mushroom. Yeah, the bottom of a portobello or something. And this is uh, Arkham doing psychedelic drugs. So again, going back to this idea of experimentation magic you know just all of these things like it's everything i can think of is in this book some version of it such an unsettling character Mm -hmm. 
could be Robert Robert England and absolutely in that profile. The, the other guy I was thinking is a uh, Jane's father from Breaking Bad season two. <laughs> Look, it's that image from the uh, title page. Yeah. That's a bat fossil, and I think it's like the oldest known bat fossil. Oh, that's is cool. what that's based on. Probably the dopest killer croc this side of Kelly Jones's. It's a really good killer croc and gets an extended sequence as a result, but looks really cool throughout. You get the one money shot. It's, it's almost like just like the regular language of comics in certain ways, like where you get the one money shot to establish. It's, this is an establishing shot. Yeah. And the rest you could put into shadow. And refers to him as the dragon. Yeah. Um, which again goes back into that some certain magical lore and language. Sure, and even just uh, the medical field where you have like the the yeah uh, the snake wrapped around that se scepter or whatever that staff. There's something about that. And panels like this, hard not to think of Dark Knight. Oh, Returns. totally, totally. Like you can imagine this drawn with some Lynn Varley color behind it. And the captions here are from the Journal of Arkham, but they could be Batman most of the time. It's it's a very cool comic book thing, and I'm glad uh, you, you pointed that out because the 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 dragon stuff is is Arkham's verbiage. So in effect, this storyline that was taking place in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, has caught up to modern day. Like it, it's it's all paying off uh, visually with that great thing that kind of only comics can do, man. Uh, where you have the visual imagery of the present day with Batman and associating some of these journal entries with the imagery that we are looking at on the page. It's it, really good. It's really neat because it sinks up tighter and tighter as the book goes on. So yeah. at this point, like I said, like I'm, I'm reading this this week and reading the captions and it's like reminding myself, this isn't Batman's words, yeah. but at this point, like it's racing things really have uh, come together at this point And it's, it makes for a very fun read. Yeah. And again, Croc is so good looking. I'm going to swamp thing in a few of these images. Sure. Make, it makes me wish these guys would do a swamp thing now. <laughs> yeah, man. But also not far from like a lost in space Star Trek zipper up the back fucking villain from a TV sci-fi show. It made me think a lot of McFarlane's Lizard, which would have been, you know, like the following year where it, it's completely the monster as opposed to a man in, in there. Yeah. And I guess kills, kills him. <laughs> That's a pretty big spear he's putting through his chest. In I think it was Batman four hundred, with the Sienkiewicz cover. Mm -hmm. We did a video on that. Check it out. He, he innovated that. Maybe before that, Bernie Wrightson, but I, but I can't recall Bernie Wrightson doing that sort of thing. As far as I could tell, it was uh, it was Sienkiewicz that introduced that, and when he did, cartoonists took note. Yes. This is this is McKean's interpretation. Kelly Jones would do versions of that, but this becomes a thing. And it's just like one of those cool comic book things where you don't have to abide by reality. This is comics. Add, add a few touches to a character. He also has the super tall, like, bat ears. Yeah, that's the Wrightson stuff. Wrightson innovated that one. It's neat how that comes and goes. You know, Miller's Dark Knight, the tiniest ears. Uh, straight up, straight up, Adam West uh, bat ears on that one. Yeah, it's it's interesting how much range that has. I love this whenever you actually see like the penciling, you know, the the letters handwritten yeah. on on it provides such a good texture. And uh, what we're approaching here is again, it's Arkham's journal, but we're going to see his his recognition of what this building is. Yeah. You know, this idea that this building is is more than um, the building itself. It's sort of the a vessel or a portal for this kind of madness. Great images here too, and I have no idea exactly what I'm looking at or how those are made. If you take a look at this version, you see like interlaced yeah. lines that feel like TV screen. Way more information there. You right. wonder if you're photographing some kind of monitor. Yeah. That's neat. Basically, you need both versions. You need the black label version for the back <laughs> matter and stuff, and then you need the, the OG because it's on a panel-by-panel -panel basis, to be honest. Yeah, I was going through this after I read it page by page, like, yeah. like with both books, one on each side. My wife, I think, thinks I should be locked in Arkham Asylum as she's watching me like 
scrutinize these pages practically with a loop. This, this we'll have another trip to Hawaii then. <laughs> I love this stuff because see, it's it's also smoothed out there where you could clearly tell that it's a doily or whatever mm -hmm. he used, and even just like overlapping it. Uh, a couple times for texture, but it just looks fully painted right there. Yeah, there's no sign of the texture that's in that original version. It's it's surprising that that can just be fuzzed, fuzzed, fuzzed out. smoothed out somehow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 this is bl it's blurrier. There's like a little Gaussian blur on there or something. Using that kind of lace pattern for uh, you know like a like a coat like a robe. But then here's another thing where the lettering is actually much tighter here. Like you could tell that it's there's almost like a digital application over top or something to, to just make sure that it's extremely clear compared to this. This effect is probably done with an unsharp mask. And mm -hmm. you can look at our Sean Robinson, Sean Michael Robinson episode and hear some detail on how that works and even see some, uh, you know, see his screen as he's explaining what that process is. And this is the, the part of the magic spell. Arkham, you know, at this point, locked in his own house and now is inscribing on the floor this spell to essentially bind the bat, to, mm -hmm. keep, to keep the madness contained here. Yes, that's the other thing uh, that is worth bringing up is that uh, this Amadeus Arkham fella, like he has visions of the bat in the same way that young Bruce Wayne did, but it's uh, it's like a totem of evil or, right. or badness. It's not something to aspire toward or to ins or to inspire you know, crime fighting in Bruce Wayne's case, it's a it's a real bad thing and it sends this guy around the bend. Yeah, it's a nice passage here too, and I think this is your British invasion speaking. I see now the virtue and madness, for this country knows no law nor any boundary. I pity the poor shades confined to the Euclidean prison that is sanity. I just love this kind of stuff visually, you know, like that that huge spiral of lettering to me was always really effective as a visual. And uh, he dies, you know, after inscribing this spell on the floor. And now this is where Batman finds himself at the uh, his lowest point, maybe. And just look at this, man, like white, uh, you know, pen, pen on black construction paper or something, chalk. Interesting. I assume that was a negative. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Why not? Boy, it'd be hard to draw that. I, I have such bad luck with white media. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine... I don't, I've never found white media that I could have drawn something like that with and it felt like it would turn out well. This is an amazing sequence. So our, I don't know, director of Arkham Asylum in the present has pretty much lost his, lost his marbles at this point, gone into the deep end, ready to be one of the inmates and threatens Batman with a, uh, with a razor after threatening the psychiatrist. And uh, she ends up, whenever the, the doctor has Batman down and, really has the drop on him she shows up grabs him by the hair and uh slits his throat yes. <laughs> like, like just straight up murders him right in front of batman who says he got what he deserved yes batman was still preserving batman's boy scoutishness of i don't kill anybody but listen i didn't say you can't kill somebody i just can't do it it's a great arc for the psychiatrist yeah and and for the director you know like like there's so many characters that are moving moving pieces throughout this story and then coming together at these various moments as we're building toward a climax. I found this spread to be really exciting as a read. He doesn't look far different than Amadeus Arkham in this piece right no, there. No, totally. A hundred percent. And you can see he doesn't have a beard normally. Yeah. So this is like like uh, Arkham is who we're seeing there for at least a, a moment. Like he's channeling that spirit. Yeah. His face right here looks like Dexter. <laughs> And now they finally find their way out, but that's for her to leave. Batman's not done yet. He's going to go tear down everything these psychiatrists have done. Starting with uh, Two-Face. Giving him the, the old uh, binary choice. You know, literally physically tearing it down, too, in part, as he's uh, cutting his way back to the center. I'm afraid to drill into certain walls in my house for fear of uh, hitting into some electricity. <laughs> I don't blame you. But Batman doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> where does where this axe, uh, where is that stored in the home for the criminally insane? Yeah, totally, right? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't seem wise. 
And Joker now, the tide has turned. You know, this whole time Joker's been in charge of this book. And at this point, it's like, we should have never left Batman in here. He's wrecking everything. And, you know, Joker, that's right, blame me. <laughs> it's such a cool, like, as a read, like, you feel those rules change. Yeah. You know, like, Batman has come out of this gauntlet. And he's, and he's on top now. He's sort of back in control. You can't tell me Batman ain't a top guy. <laughs> <laughs> Look at his physique. That's where it looks like the Chris Nolan... Uh, totally. That, that like hole in the side of his mouth. Absolutely. I always think of with that Chris Nolan version. Gives him back his coin and, and it's up to Harvey Dent to decide should Batman stay or should he go. Yes. The unmarked face comes up, he goes free. If it's a scarred face, he dies here. Flips the coin, and when you're reading this, there is no suspense, right? Like, there's zero suspense. Of course Batman's going to get to go free. We just automatically know that. And it almost feels a little weak, because it's like, of course he's going to go free. It's a Batman comic. He's never not going to go free. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the bad guy's just like, okay, listen... You know, we're true to our word. We're, we're gamblers and we abide by our debts and stuff. Like, yeah, go free. Sayonara. Take care. I love it. Joker walk, walks him to the door and he's like, enjoy yourself out there in the asylum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's always a place for you here. And then this is the page that you don't see coming. When, when Harvey Dent's like just staring at that coin and it is the scarred side. Thus letting us all know that Batman needs to exist for these villains to function and have their their purpose. You know, it wasn't Joker who decided it, as we might have expected. You know, it's 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 Dent telling us that. There's some cool stuff going on too visually, where I think this may be like a it's some kind of a layer where the cards feel like they're photographed as like real cards, mm -hmm. but then clearly it's a painting in the background behind. Yeah, and it's it looks different something about you know like it's almost out of focus in the foreground the cards right yeah but there's totally. some, some games going on once again mckeen with his uh all kinds of uh s secret techniques that he's able to pull out and it's more illuminating here because you could see the paste up here and he fuzzes it out in uh this like remastered edition but you could see the clear paste ups happening mm -hmm. yeah yeah in that edition it almost looks like Two faces like cut out in yeah. these negative shapes and put put in. It's so interesting to think because you would do this so differently in Photoshop now, but in 1989 it was like literally cutting this stuff out, pasting it together, I feel maybe like, some paint on the edges. I feel like the first time I ever saw Photoshop being used, like in in uh, um, articles and shit, was Dave McKean's um, Sandman paintings. Like he would create practical stuff. Like he would do a painting, have a big curio. Literally, uh, the covers are a snapshot in time because sometimes he's burning little incense things and, and, like, you know, that doesn't burn forever. So he's just capturing this, like, second in time. But there's, like, a Photoshop element, like, on top of that. And it's the first time I ever heard photo Photoshop, like, used in, in the realm of comics. And with, an, with like, like, sort of leaning into the photo part of Photoshop... How much credit does everybody involved with those Sandman covers deserve? Because I don't know if that's Neil Gaiman being like, Karen, listen, this is this will work. Or if it's Karen going like, McKean's portfolio is amazing if that's what he thinks is a cover. You know, like, they're the so different than every other comic book cover at that time period. And it becomes a huge influence on the Vertigo books and, yeah. and other books after that. But that initial, like, we're going to launch this book and this is the direction we're going to go with the covers, credit to everybody involved in that because that's, that's one of the bold creative decisions you see in comics history. Yeah, check out uh, Brian Hibbs has a Zoom conversation. I believe it's Brian Hibbs. Uh, Neil Gaiman's there. Karen Berger's there. Uh, one or two other people. And Gaiman lays it down. Like, McKean was about to be fired or something for, from the cover duties. And Neil Gaiman's like, no, 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 like, he's the cover guy. He's got to do it. Uh, I think McKean was overworked, doing some other stuff. Ultimately, something happened where, like, he turned three covers in in a day. Like, he knew that the job was on the line or something. He took, he took the weekend and built, you know, a handful of covers. And was like, here's the covers for the next round, man. Like, I'm the cover guy. So 
It's pretty interesting to think about that book because those are the two creatives I think of first and foremost Absolutely. when I think of Sandman. And it's like, I can't name another book where I think that strongly is of the cover artist. Like Preacher, really distinct Glenn Fabry covers, but Steve Dillon is so consistent in that book that it's like, I, I, it's not like I think of Fabry over Dillon when I think of Preacher. Yeah. But with Sandman, those covers are a piece. Like they Absolutely. really create some kind of a surreal landscape gateway doorway something it's a different experience yeah yeah i would say it's a it's the covers for sandman it's it's the it's the covers for animal man the brian ballin joints and uh, a lot both of those kind of are affected in the same way by sp spotty artwork on the insides to an extent you know you never know who you're going to get uh inside those pages sometimes you get a ruler sometimes you just get somebody who had to get that work done in that month so here's that, uh, I mentioned these characters having their profiles in the back. Uh, I think Batman and Joker work really well. You know, the very distinct lettering for both of them. Yeah, and it makes sense. Very clinical. Like, you imagine it banged out on, like, a detective's uh, typewriter. What I, what, so here's what disappoints me in the design of these back matter. If I'm doing Batman, I think that it's like a type document. It's not the serial killer uh, kidnapping you know, pasted up pieces because of the order, right? Like you could redact things, but have it a little bit more organized because once we get further in, it feels to me like these are all the same letter. Uh -huh. Even though there's some differences, but like spacing and everything's really consistent. Like, especially here where we have like four of them, you can see that. I don't know, there's something about it. It's almost like, I assume this is Saladino doing this. I wonder because, because uh, like, you we, know uh, we know McKean's work. Oh yeah, it could work. be McKean, yeah. We know McKean's work. And, uh, like, that's McKean's hand. Like, you see that in Mr. Punch. You see this in Mr. Punch. These, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say, say it's McKean. Oh, I bet you're right. Either way, it feels like one hand. Yeah. And that's the part that I, I wish it felt more different. It's a challenge. Like, sometimes when I'm doing a lettering job and I want multiple, I'll make other people do lettering for me. I mean. Like, like make my wife write a note, you know, because it's, there's no way to, it's hard to step out too far. You're the guy who could speak on it, man. Uh. If you if you want to like do a little self congratulations, man, put up that blowjob bathroom <laughs> with the graffiti, like because that that looks like a bunch of different hands. You know, you're using different tools and stuff, so you're certainly the guy to speak. There, on there, there might be some other hands in that. I, I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it's hard to get out of uh, you know your own like spacing and things. You know, sure. there's just these little tells, if you will, uh, profiles on your creators. But the nice thing with this black label edition is. Committed to the Asylum, a note on the restoration of this book by Dave McKean. So you get some examples, but you really get him talking about this stuff. There's your Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, you know, realizing going through this, just how much some of the panels are straight out of Bill Sienkiewicz's work of the time. I think it's impossible not to, to have that. I think every artist at some point you're going to have Bill Sienkiewicz on your pages because once you see his stuff, how do you avoid it? Uh, Karen Berger with an afterword on it. Really nice. This is from the 15th anniversary edition in 2004. So again, you get some historical context to the book, how it was received. Um, and I think it was one of Morrison's first pitches. Whenever they were meeting, like the, the British talent, he came in and I think it was Animal Man and, uh, and Arkham Asylum were like two of the pitches that he showed up in the meeting. And, you know, here we go. Talk about hitting the ground running. Batman, a serious house on serious earth. Yeah, so final draft. And noteworthy because the red at the bottom is Grant Morrison providing notes. It's not exactly annotated, but there'll be notes on maybe things that didn't make it into the final draft. Um, this is where I saw the note about the Joker wearing the Madonna getup. So some of it very extensive, some of it, you know, nothing to add to it. But it's cool to see just the breakdown. And it's not written like, you know, page one, panel one. I love the lack of pretense in typewritten scripts. You know, like, that's all you need. It's 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 the writer version of when you see certain mangaka studios and they just have the lap board on, like, a kitchen table. Right. Yeah, exactly. And it's the complete script. So pretty cool for any aspiring writers or people who love this book or just want to see how, you know, an original creator really comes about, uh, you know, their process. These are the sketches for the cover. And I mentioned earlier how, you know, this would have been, like, it would have said Watchmen on the Watchmen, and then this would have been your your image, and here it's flipped. The text is taking up three quarters of the cover, and the image is like the, the band. And now this is really cool. Grant Morrison, not just a gifted writer, but uh, also an accomplished artist, and layouts. And pretty detailed, like, 
developed layouts. Yeah, n- not bad, but you could tell that like this this looks just like uh, comics, you know, yes. like comics as we know them. Uh, so, so I don't see it provided much value to, to McKean in a lot of ways. Yeah, I thought that too. I wonder if this is something that's more important for the writer than yeah. it is for the artist. You hear about Alan Moore doing thumbnails often and then not even giving them to his artist. It's yeah. a way to... And Neil Gaiman in his master class talks about folding the piece of paper in half and, and writing with you know kind of the space in mind. So hard to tell. You know, I often think whenever I'm doing my own stuff, writing and drawing, I go back and forth with some writing and then some drawing because it informs the others. So it's possible Grant Morrison, uh, you know, may have similar experience. And then some Dave McKean picking up with his layouts, which I think this is a ballpoint pen, a lot of it. Yeah. And you can see, fun to compare the Grant Morrison layouts with the Dave McKean because you can see it like moving in the direction that it would become the book from uh, starting as a more traditional comic. Absolutely, man. And, and this is like skinned in color rather than probably like grayscale and like kayfabed a little bit to get the pure black and white like he's letting us see warts and all also indicating where the lettering should be placed oh it's so interesting i don't think i noticed in the read that that it's batman shadow in between those those pieces yeah it's him moving towards um you know like going into arkham asylum is is those in between shots yeah like like see these ones are Right, it's super unclear. It's it's this. That's the exact. This yeah. is the exact spread. Yeah, yeah. You can see the. Cool. So you get a few of those early uh, study for Amadeus Arkham. Totally ballpoint there. Yeah. And then some of the different covers, and this is the cover Ed that you showed. This is the first edition that I had from uh, its original release. And then some of the. Uh, Japanese hardcover, you know, some of the anniversary editions. This is a clay mask of the Joker that I mentioned. Did he? You know, like it, a starting point. So he made that? I can't answer that. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's a prop, something that he found as a starting point, or I if mean, it's it, something he made himself. That looks, that looks too much like Joker. It really does. You can see like an early sketch of Joker, clearly based on that mask. I think that he keeps going, you know, like the stuff that's in here. That's the other thing you hear about artists that use reference, but then like, how do you push that reference to make it your own? And it's so cool to go from like seeing an early reference to what's in this book. Yeah. Because it's it's worked through. It continues to uh, evolve. And then I showed you these before we start recording. Convention sketches. What are you talking about? What <laughs> convention is this? Like oil painters of the world or something? It's that thing too, because like this is that the man who laughs guy done up as joker you know uh so he's looking at reference even while while he's doing his little quote-unquote con sketch yeah i can't it blows my mind like and that might be cesar romero's the starting place on that one is this is this like you did one sketch at san diego and it took all week like what how are you doing these 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 dudes who master these these different media like they know how to be quick with it there's an absolute edition. I'm kind of curious to see that because I assume that's a big oversize. This feels like an absolute edition. Yeah, it does. I mean, what more can you put in there? Every single rough? Yeah, it's a nice collection. Um, I was surprised. I found this one used recently whenever we started talking about doing this book on here. Yeah. And uh, it's almost like some sign of the of the universe that this crossed my path at the right right time but i love all the extras like it's a really nice addition for oh that. absolutely man when you had both i was like Wait, what's the what's the point but it's very clear that it wasn't just selling old rope like they added tremendous value to that black label edition yeah absolutely so batman arkham asylum i think it remains kind of as good now as it did probably when it came out maybe even better now because at least for me i'm able to read this and it makes more sense than whenever i read it as a youngster as, a, as an early comic book reader a lot of it was over my head There's now i think only a little bit of it's over my head <laughs> once you once you discover that thing with the with the different typefaces as different voices uh that, that that makes for an easier experience but you have to you have to figure that out at some point through through some comic or another I'm good to go if you are, Jimmy. Yep. K Fabers. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. And we need more subscribers because we're only 20, 35,000 away from uh, getting our 100,000 fo- uh, follower plaque from That's YouTube. The, the next big marker. What do you have out there, Jimmy? 
It is time to pre-order Hulk Grand Design, the Treasury Collection. That'll be out in time for Christmas, but you need to pre-order it now from your local comic shop or wherever you buy books. It's a big oversized edition like the other Grand Designs, the X-Men and Fantastic Four. Super excited to work on that Treasury size edition. And uh, that is available for pre-order now. The Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive from Image Comics uh, out of print is coming back in print in August. So you can also have your store Order that now. As soon as those books are available, they'll show up at your local comic shop. And you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see a lot more of my comics, download some out of print stuff, and uh, basically see the process by which I make my comics. The Red Room Trigger Warnings trade paperback is going to hit stores in September. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. They are banned in more than 28 countries, banned in more than 10 comic shops, so you may need to go online to reserve your copy. Make sure you do so so that we can make sure that we get one to you because it will sell out quick. Uh, you can hit up my link tree in the description below to put in your reservations. Uh, you can hit up my Patreon and uh, read all those comics uh, digitally uh, this very day, man. Three bucks gets you the archive there and I'm putting new strips up every Tuesday including the next round of forthcoming Red Room comics will start serializing up there very very shortly. Jimmy, what else do we have out there? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Given those marching orders, Jimmy, will be on our way. Read more comics.